continues. It was during the State of the Union when the president used the speech to make a short section to talk about his desire for research on the brain. Now, if we want to make the best products, we also have, have to invest in the best ideas. Every dollar we invested to map the human genome returned $140 to our economy. Every dollar. Today, our scientists are mapping the human brain to unlock the answers to Alzheimer's. Joining us from Boston is George Church. He's with Harvard Medical School. He's a genetics professor, also has experience with the Human Genome Project. Uh, Dr. Church, thanks for joining us. Hi, it's great to be here. So, Dr. Church, what was the president talking about? What's, what is he proposing? Well, I think he's uh, speaking in broad uh, strokes there, and I think a number of people have weighed in since, since that time. Uh, I, you know, I can ad address the, the science of the, of the brain activity map, which is uh, aimed at uh, uh, ultimately a project to uh, develop technology that could uh, bring down the cost and uh, improve uh, our, uh, uh, ultimately our clinical applications of measuring and stimulating large number of neurons in complex circuits that are important for uh, human and animal behavior. So to, uh, could you first tell us where the federal government comes in as far as their ability to, to map the human brain, learn more about it that's not already done at, at medical research facilities across the United States? Well, I think we are uh, very much talking about research that is already done, uh, but the opportunity exists for, for making it uh, much more cost effective for all the research that is done. There's on the order of half a billion dollars of uh, research that's done, and if our experience from genomics uh, holds true, we've brought the cost down about a, a million fold in the last uh, decade uh, for genomics. And if we could do the same thing here, it would be uh, a huge impact on uh, both uh, research and uh, clinical applications. So on the science side, what does it mean to map the human brain? So it's very important to think of this differently as a kind of a static map that you might use like a street map. Uh, this, is a, this is a dynamic one and something that, that could be personalized from person to person and, to and moment to moment. Uh, it's, it's really technology that enables us to look uh, not at a coarse uh, level, but at a very fine level uh, individual neurons, which is the unit of activity uh, for the brain. So the, 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 the mapping is to pr provide us a way of looking at uh, how our brain act works in normal activity and in pathological states and to fix it real time, potentially. So give us an example of what faces researchers, especially if the federal government gets involved, what faces them as they go forward on this project and what difficulty are we talking about? Well, the opportunities here are, are uh, we have some examples of, of, of brain monitoring and stimulation like cochlear implants and uh, retinal implants and uh, brain stem injury uh, where you can get a tetraplegic to be able to uh, move uh, objects. Uh, th these are great challenges. Uh, we have a little, little bit of activity clinically where you might be able to put in a dozen electrodes, maybe even a hundred, um, but to get the fine structure uh, uh, you need something between the hundred that we can do and the hundred billion that, that they exist in the brain. And that's a, uh, a gigantic uh, uh, challenge that uh, can be addressed by nanotechnology, synthetic biology, new optical uh, fiber methods and so on. So essentially what will happen on the research side is that you'll find, I guess, test subjects to help you with this, and what does it mean for them, or how does that work? Well, we already have uh, uh, clinical uh, applications such as the ones I just, just mentioned that, that involve uh, research subjects that have a lot to gain. Uh, the, some experiments will be done uh, in, in, in animals uh, uh, to develop the technology and uh, make sure that it's safe. Uh, you know, I think that this could go well beyond uh, uh, the, the applications that we already have in place for electrodes and become, become much less invasive and apply to uh, neurodegenerative and neuropsychiatric uh, uh, disorders as well, as well as normal behavior. So when you, because you were involved in the Human Genome Project, once a brain gets mapped, 
What does it do for fields like those going through degenerative diseases? What does it do for how we handle our emotions? What does it do for you know how we you know have memory, especially if you've uh, survived an accident, things like that? Will those areas be improved, or the ability to understand uh, those areas improve because of what we're doing or what's being proposed? I, th I think those and many others. I th what's important is is for us not to overpromise on a particular disease and a particular date, but what we what we can do is make uh, strong efforts to uh, bring down the costs, improve the quality, lower the invasiveness uh, of uh, of the methods, and uh, increase the comprehensiveness. So if a, if a neural circuit requires a very large number of neurons to be uh, simultaneously monitored and stimulated, we can in improve the technology for that. And this will be a benefit uh, for researchers and clinicians uh, uh, worldwide. A proposal? Although it's also an op Oh, go ahead. It's also an opportunity for the United States to, to continue technology leadership. Uh, a proposal to map the human brain, as it were. Coming from the president, our guest here to talk about the science side of it and what uh, the government can do, technology that's being used, and what could happen because of it. If you want to ask him questions, here's how you can do so. For, Democrat, for Republicans, it's 202-585-3881. For Democrats, 202-585-3880. For independents, 202-585-3882. You can uh, tweet us at C-SPAN WJ, email us at journal at C-SPAN.org. Uh, Professor Church, we have an email or a tweet that says, uh, Professor, much, must, uh, there's much misunderstanding, so discuss what the map of the human genome is and is not, and then expand it to project for uh, mapping the brain. Right, so uh, the, the, the original project for the human genome uh, w was to simply sequence uh, that is determine the ACs, Gs, and Ts that compose our genome, but we all knew from the beginning that we would also have to compare many human genomes and, the, and their traits and many uh, other organisms. And, and really the payoff for the Genome Project, um, which uh, has, has been quite large, uh, is the technology that we can now apply in, uh, in clinical settings for measuring microorganisms, for measuring um, uh, uh, carrier status, uh, for, for uh, various inherited diseases, cancer, and so forth. This is just really be, uh, playing out uh, quite amazingly in the, in the marketplace and uh, in research labs all over the world. Our first call is from James Clifton Springs, New York, Republican line. You're on with Professor George Church of Harvard Medical School. Go ahead. Mr. George Church, Harvard Medical School. I think it's great because I had an MRI on my brain for supposedly dementia, and I almost got a kick out of it because I do not have dementia at all. And I also give you credit for working with Teddy Roosevelt's, not Teddy Roosevelt, Ted Kennedy's issue of his brain, which could be wonderful. The other issue is, through time, we have become involved with improving and hopefully, like you said, the cost. The other issue that stands real tall, uh, the equipment that we use and the acquisition the, where people dementia or Alzheimer's, and I know that Alzheimer's is generally for CPAs, bookkeeping, strong, and a very close friend of mine has Alzheimer's 1. And some people make a lot of fun of them, and I think that needs to be stopped. Thank you. Professor Church, go ahead. Right. So, I mean, I think that you raise a number of uh, important questions, uh, like how, how are we going to get diagnostics uh, uh, that, that are accurate. Uh, certainly that's going to require approval process, such as m many of the diagnostics we have today. Uh, and uh, th that a lot of that's already in place. Uh, the cost is, uh, is important, and, and you'll see that as a continuing uh, refrain that we have here. And uh, hopefully there'll be many diseases that are, that are impacted. It, this will not be a, a cure-all or a one-size-fits-all. The idea is to stimulate out-of-the-box thinking have our uh, uh, 
young people especially uh, feel enabled by this and, and to encourage small science in various uh, forms. Uh, Professor Church, I guess as an overview, how does the brain work? And then be, with that in mind, what's being investigated or at least proposed by this mapping project? Right, well, I think uh, uh, the, the general architecture of the brain uh, and the general uh, operations at the cellular level uh, are understood. The, what's, imp what's missing are, are the things in between. That is, the, thing, the things between the sort of low resolution uh, structure and, and activity that you can see, say, in MRI that, that the caller mentioned. And, uh, and the very fine-grained things that we can do at amazing levels of microscopy and, uh, and electrode measurements, that needs to be connected. There's this whole interesting realm where you have the 100 billion neurons of various subsets uh, interact, uh, and, and it being able to monitor them at, uh, many at once is now possible, be not just because of our increased computational ability to uh, measure, um, model, and then feedback and stimulate, but, but these new nanotechnologies and, uh, and, and finer optical technologies and, um, and, and so forth. Max is from College Station, Texas, Democrats line. Hi. Hey. Your on, sir. Okay, my question for Dr. Church is, do you think any spin-off industries will come from brain activity mapping? Well, the beauty of, of this project, uh, maybe even more than the Genome Project, is that this uh, th there's already a number of uh, relevant in industries uh, which in include uh, imaging, which is diagnostic, uh, st deep brain stimulation for epilepsy, and uh, various uh, uh, fairly relatively crude treatments that can get be greatly improved. So, so that infrastructure is in place, and we hope to. Uh, to improve it by factors of 10 um, on a regular basis. Uh, there are other industries less obvious. So, uh, for example, artificial intelligence and, the, and, and big data and uh, so forth, they can learn about how the human brain works, or they could be involved in managing the, the, the uh, gigantic tsunami of, of data that will flow out of this sort of project, uh, both research and clinical. Uh, Dr. Church, uh, the Financial Times had a write-up about the, the president's proposal and some other related matters. It talked about an effort in Switzerland called the Blue Brain Project. Uh, it goes a little technical, but it says uh, in stimulating neural circuitry, it's uh, involved in the process as an IBM Blue Gene supercomputer feeding data from the studies of real brains to build a virtual brain. Can you expand on that? Sure. Uh, we, we do hope uh, as we did in the Genome Project, to uh, have an internationally coordinated project. Uh, th th uh, what we're doing in the United States already and will in the brain activity map include uh, computational modeling. Uh, much of, and, but uh, the emphasis will be on, on measurement and stimulation, which allows you to test the models that, that, uh, that are developed in computers. I think that's critical. Uh, to, to coordinate the, the models with the measurements and with the tests of them. Uh, Vicki from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Good morning on our independent line. Good morning. Um, I was just wondering with regard to uh, the gene, uh, we found that the absence of the presence of a certain gene would indicate possible criminal behavior. How would this possibly assist when you're talking about children who come with disorders that may be bipolar or ADHD or schizophrenia that could be detected early. I would hope that that kind of uh, mapping would be, uh, it would be something that would be a priority for, for those people. And especially, as Dr. Church, as far as Alzheimer's, we know that about 5 million Americans living with Alzheimer's as it stands, and it impacts about one in eight older Americans, the sixth leading cause of death in the U.S., uh, so can this, I know you referred to it before, but, you know, this research kind of help those conditions later on or at least alleviate those? Right, so, so the caller uh, uh, correctly uh, reminds us that uh, genetics and stem cell therapies and so forth are, are extremely important parts of the, of the research and, and future clinical uh, aspects of, of brain uh, 
technology and science, and we need to emphasize those along with this brain activity map. And I think there's going to be some tremendous opportunities for synergy. The brain activity map certainly is using synthetic biology as one of the uh, methodologies. And we need to, but back to the question of you know, predisposition to certain uh, genetic disorders, uh, this is um, in some cases uh, highly accurate, meaning um, uh, highly predictable, in other cases less so at our current knowledge. It's important to consider the environmental components and that's just really um, still uh, in the future for many of these diseases is integrating the genetics and environment and being able to measure f uh, brain activity in a, in a highly uh, uh, high, high, high fine granularity uh, will help us connect the genetics, the environment, the day-to-day the -day activity of the brain, and the final outcomes um, uh, many years later. And I, I think it's important to, to try to be as, uh, encourage these technologies to allow us to be more accurate in our uh, uh, diagnoses Miami Beach, and Florida, treatments. Miami Deep, uh, Beach, Florida, Prachi on our Democrats line. Hello. Hi, you're on. Hi, uh, Dr. Church, I have a question uh, in terms of the technology that you're going to use. Uh, we know that with functional MRI and with PET, we are able to look at cortical activation patterns. But I want to understand more, uh, you know, with reference to the high-resolution imaging you just talked about, uh, microscopy and optics and, uh, and laser, if we are able to utilize that during task and resting state in the live human brain, and how good are those technologies? Right, so we're talking about a broad range of technologies. Any improvement in the current imaging uh, methods, uh, whether it's uh, uh, fMRI or, or, or uh, dMRI or various other uh, methodologies, would be welcome. And, and integrated with, uh, with uh, electrodes and, and, and optical uh, fiber uh, methods, which are, for the most part, uh, the, the optical methods that, uh, used in animals so far, I think they look very promising, and the and the opportunity here is to get the uh, in, increase the technology uh, rapidly. Uh, Dr. Church, a couple of things. The Washington Post, when they wrote about this proposal, wrote this. They said um, it's easy to see how a company such as Google could build on findings from the Brain Activity Map Project and build new brain assistance for our computing devices that mimic the activity of the human brain. At the same time, entirely new companies may emerge offering futuristic services such as cosmic brain surgery or total recall. Off of Twitter, we have a viewer who asked, you know, on, with that in mind, does brain mapping a precursor to digitizing memories, personalities, etc.? I think it's uh, a little hard to predict uh, where this is going. I think we need a uh, we need, uh, ethical, legal, social oversight at every stage. Uh, it's never too early to start those discussions. Uh, I think we need to also avoid over-promising if these are considered desirable. Uh, uh, but, but certainly, if any of those uh, are to happen, then we'll need projects like this to get us uh, close enough so that we can uh, do this in a um, uh, a, a safe and, and highly predictive manner. Can you expand about, expand on your statement, we need ethical, legal oversight on these kind of matters? Well, I think that just as we have uh, sort of asked ourselves in the, in the Genome Project and in synthetic biology uh, and in many other uh, recent fields, uh, there's, a, there's a need to think of all the different ways that this can, uh, the risks and the benefits, the ways that can go right and wrong, and uh, anticipate those years in advance uh, at a time where it doesn't seem urgent. So uh, some of the ones that were just li listed on that, that sheet, uh, uh, just the tip of the iceberg. And we have such conversations going on already, and we hope to have uh, more as this project ramps up. Uh, Sarah from Olympia, Washington, Independent Line. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Um, I am... Um I'm curious whether or not there's been a, um, a Bayes theorem uh, app applied to try to estimate the pretest probability that we'll find anything that's uh, worth uh, worth the cost. And so, um, 
you know, if, if you use a, a Bayes' theorem, you have to have a pretest probability that you'll have a positive or a negative outcome, and you also have to have a post-test result, and using those two, you can then determine whether or not the pretest probability was close enough to the post-test reality to justify the cost of such a huge um, project. And if it doesn't match with the Bayes theorem, uh, then how do you justify spending all this money mapping random things on random people that may not necessarily correlate uh, between person to person and or if you mistakenly correlate two things uh, or more between one individual and another, well then uh, Cor correlation is not related to causality, so you end up with more information than you want to deal with, it seems like. so. Caller, thank you. Right. I think you raised some interesting points, uh, things that we are uh, definitely on, on, on our front, front lines of uh, inquiry. So uh, w the hope is to bring down the cost of ongoing research. Uh, there, there will be some investment required to do that, uh, but as, but, and it is hard to just apply something theoretical like Bayes' theorem in advance. But I think we can see uh, precedence, maybe uh, is the is the term, uh, rather than something highly theoretical, where uh, a small investment has re in the case of genome project a million times uh, lower costs. Uh, uh, and uh, higher quality have, have resulted. In this particular case, uh, we, we want to be attentive to uh, the, the cost effectiveness uh, as you would for any diagnostic and therapeutic uh, going forward. What was the cost of the genome project and can you relate those to how much this, or at least the federal money that might be required to, to make this thing happen? Uh, Right. Well, so the the cost of the genome project was uh, originally estimated and and delivered at about three billion dollars. Uh, uh, I think that uh, the the costs have come down considerably as a consequence of that and as activities since then. Uh, the Patel report, which uh, uh, Obama referred to in the clip that you showed at the beginning, uh, estimated 140 uh, fold return on investment. I think that uh, that. And, and that report said that that could grow over time. I think this is true of many effective technologies. is not necessarily exceptional, but it, it is quite remarkable uh, to see it happening so quickly. Uh, well, just one last point on the previous caller's uh, uh, question about uh, uh, g getting information that, that applying to one person and not to another. The intention is to have this personalized. It's the technology that we can use on a day-to-day -day on individuals. And uh, the question about correlation versus causation, if we can not only measure but stimulate uh, neurons as, as occurs uh, in, in certain clinical procedures already uh, for epilepsy and so on, uh, then we can test hypotheses from the beginning of the project. And I think that's one of the, the hopes is not to just collect a one-size-fits-all data set for one person and assume it applies to other people, but to test causality uh, as we go along and on a and develop technology that's as low invasiveness as possible and applicable uh, to many people um, real time. How long is this type of research going to take? Do you think? Well, you know, it's it's it, it's it's something that that may be better off uh, without a. a, a a strict deadline, that is to say that the Human Genome Project in a certain sense continues and, get, and grows now into Personal Genome Project and other that where we're now doing hundreds of thousands of, of, of human genomes already. Uh, we hope that there will be a moment uh, or two along the Bain Activity Map where we can say, okay, we, this is, we now have technology that's capable of what we set out to do, and now let's apply it uh, uh, more broadly to a variety of interesting uh, problems. Uh, both research and clinical. Uh, this is Donald, Colleen, Texas, Republican Line. Hey. You're on. Hey, uh, thank you. Good, good morning. Um, basically, uh, I have a cleft lip and palate. Um, uh, a lot of doctors have told me. Hello? You're on. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, I uh, 
have a cleft open palate. A lot of doc- doctors have told me it's not genetic, um, but I can tell you throughout my family, I have four, five uh, in my family over several generations that have this. Um, so, but regardless of that, I mean, I'm for anything that uh, if if you can uh, find out if, for any reason things that uh, basically cause certain things, uh, certain uh, disorders or whatever, I'm all for that. I mean, thanks, caller. Yeah, again, I think this raises the important point that this that the brain activity map should be one that's highly integrated with other neuroscience uh, uh, efforts, including neurogenetics and uh, uh, neuronal stem cells and other pluripotent uh, uh, stem cell projects. Uh, Professor Church, uh, we've been talking here about budget cuts that go or plan to go into effect next week. Uh, does the National Institutes of Health get affected if they get budget cuts overall to the larger part of what's going on with the, the brain mapping project? Could, could that prove to be a, a difficulty? Well, really, I can only address the science uh, with any expertise, but I can uh, offer my personal opinion, which is we need projects like this to inspire uh, the, the American public to get back to its leadership position and to bring down costs and, and improve productivity. Hopefully that they will see this as a reason to, to get our act together uh, uh, f- financially and, and start funding some of the things that, that actually keep our, our country going. Uh, from Twitter, Jody asks, is it true that the human brain is hardwired when you are young? Uh, so probably the simplest, uh, maybe oversimplified, is no, it is not hardwired. There's a, a the, the whole, all the way up into very old age, we're, we're learning and the, wi- and the wiring is, is changing. The, the so-called synaptic weights are changing. We, we, can, we can learn uh, uh, to, to uh, our whole life. Uh, but there is a lot that is, that is wired up uh, by your genetics and a lot that is wired up during your early experiences. So it's a continuum that we will learn a great deal more about uh, if we go forward. Cyril is from Lincoln, California. He's on our Democrats line. Hello. Uh, good morning, Pedro. Thanks for taking my call. Thank you for C-SPAN. Uh, my question goes to the, um, and, and I guess it kind of relates to an earlier question, but how do you how would you incorporate in your project, uh, either in your assumptions or your structure, the fact that different parts of the brain uh, can be used for different things in different individuals? For example, people who are blind from birth use their visual cortex uh, for other senses and other things. So there a, there's a, seems to be a huge variability from individual to individual. How do you incorporate that? into your project, in, in, in your structure assumptions? Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful question, uh, and, and I think it, it reflects uh, our effort to uh, make technology so inexpensive that it can be used for personalized uh, medicine uh, in the same sense that now the genomics is cheap enough that we can have uh, personalized uh, uh, genetic a diagnosis and uh, and personalized therapies. Uh, in the, in this case, it, it's wonderful how how plastic the brain is, how adaptable it it can be as the as the examples you gave. And we hope that this will uh, uh, allow us to, to 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 leverage that when we get to therapies, uh, so that we can uh, now re- repurpose uh, different parts of the brain uh, to compensate for. Uh, either genetic, environmental, or, or, or uh, uh, damage-related um, uh, pathologies. David Eagleman writes in the New York Times this morning. He's a professor of uh, neuroscience at Baylor College. He goes on to say that it's, the brain is composed of 100 billion electrically active cells called neurons, each connected to many thousands of its neighbors. Each neuron relays information in the form of miniature voltage spikes, which are then converted to chemical signals that bridge the gap to other neurons. Most neurons signal these, send these signals many times per second. It's each signaling event would make a sound as loud as a pin dropping, 
The cacophony from a single human head would blow out by all the windows. The complexity of such a system bankrupts our language, observes, uh, observing our brain with our current technologies. We mostly detect an enigmatic uproar. Um, any response to that, uh, Professor? Uh, I think that's, that's uh, right on target. It's a it's very uh, uh, poetic and accurate uh, representation of the challenge in front of us. What's, what, what's terrific about our new science, whether ranging from um, you know, astrophysics, particle physics, genome projects, and so forth, is we are capable of handling big data, coming up with models that, that uh, coalesce the data into, into something that's coherent, and then most importantly, we'll be able to, to test it. And in, I think in this case, that's one of our top priorities, is being able to um, take this cacophony of, of uh, pin dropping uh, from hundreds of millions, uh, billions of uh, neurons and, uh, and turn them into models that, that uh, can guide uh, stimulation patterns and ultimately therapies. Rhonda from Arlington, Virginia, thanks for waiting. Independent Line. Oh, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, I just wanted to ask the guest, I'm sure um, he's aware that there are patents uh, that go back for advanced technology dealing with brain research back to the 50s and 60s, and there really is no national dialogue about the research that already exists. Uh, there are support groups and victims that are coming out in droves on the Internet. You can just do Google searches on targeted individuals, organized stalking, synthetic telepathy, and they are begging for help because there is a misuse, I'll give it a broad category, of directed energy weaponry, and whether it's rogue elements of, of government or research at, researchers at universities, um, they're using this technology already and experimenting and testing on United, United States citizens illegally. Now, the NBC affiliate in Palm Springs, California, just did a story recently on hundreds of people hearing voices, um, and this was on the NBC affiliate, and through voice to skull technology, synthetic te telepathy. Jesse Ventura just did an hour-long program um, on mind control technology, and I just, uh, right now, uh, Senator Ron Wyden and Richard Burr and uh, our so, caller, what's tonight. the que what's the question for our guest caller? The question is, how do you address um, this technology that's already out there? That thanks, caller. Right. Well, I I, I think that uh, I'm. I think the sort of technology you're talking about is still mostly in the future, and it, and as we mentioned earlier in the program, there's incredibly important to have uh, these discussions about the ethical, legal, and social components of that, as we've done on, on other projects. We need, um, uh, <coughs> as each of these technologies uh, could have uh, in, incorporated into them monitoring so that, uh, so that we know how, how the instruments are being used. There could be laws that, that do uh, uh, for surveillance of all such instruments. Um, I think it's relatively difficult to, to uh, it will be, it will be difficult to work on uh, communicating with uh, the human brain uh, without uh, the full participation of, of uh, or, and close proximity to the person in, in question. Uh, that's certainly our, our uh, this project is not aimed at, at, at affecting brains at a distance, but, uh, but having very intimate contact, probably requiring, uh, currently requiring electrodes to be uh, uh, implanted and hooked up to uh, uh, computers and other devices. Professor Church, how uh, did you? I, oh, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no that's, that's that's fine. Yeah. Uh, how did you get involved in brain research? Uh, so um, I, I'm I'm a technologist from from uh, all the way back uh, to my early education. Uh, the, uh, technology for um, reading and writing biological systems, that is to say, input and output uh, at, at many different levels. Uh, we've, so I've had a long-term interest in uh, in uh, genetics and, and genomics, and uh, we've recently been de uh, developing technology that's applicable to this uh, uh, brain activity map. Uh, George Church joins us. Uh, he's with Harvard uh, Medical School, uh, talking about uh, brain mapping a proposal from the White House to kind of enhance what's going on already. Uh, Walden, New York, Rep uh, Republican line. Tom, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, C-SPAN. Um, 
We, my wife and I have been dealing with our daughter for four years plus now on a, a viral infection, what we thought is uh, the cause of her sleep disorder, and I go to the technology in, like, Pandora's box once it's open. Good luck trying to change it. I agree with his ethics uh, concern. But uh, we're thankful for the technology because uh started off with an MRI, which wasn't conclusive, but now we just uh, went down to New York City and had a spec scan that shows some promising things to get to the root cause of uh her disorder. So I just wanted to make that if uh, he's in lead with the private sector also or just the government. Thank you. Right. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, th I, I think that uh, there are some definite opportunities here for integrating with uh, instrumentation uh, and, and even um, microbial influences on our general health, but also specifically on, on behavior and and neuropathology. So, uh, uh, as always, it, it would be terrific if this uh, is a well integrated project, integrated with ongoing research, uh, which is amazing, as well as uh, uh, multiple fields that are adjacent to brain activity. Arthur joins us from Livingston Manor, New York. Democrats line. Arthur, we're just about to finish, so if you go ahead straight to your question or comment, please. Oh, yeah, good morning. Uh, I was wondering if you had any time frame with, as far as this mapping. Uh, of what it would do to help uh, brain disease like Alzheimer's and maybe even uh, criminology? Professor Church. Yes, right. So we hope the project as a whole will make major uh, strides, maybe factors of 10 improvement in, in uh, cost effectiveness and accuracy over the next decade. Uh, Alzheimer's and criminology may not be the, the top priorities nor the top payoffs for this uh, uh, project, uh, possibly in, in collaboration with, uh, in the case of Alzheimer's, with work on genetics and, and stem cell technology, we can make a small contribution. Uh, with uh, criminology, I mean, that's a, that's a very tall order, and, uh, and we'll have to wait and see how that, what, what we can do. Uh, uh, to contribute to, to the genetic, environmental, and brain activity components of that. So another viewer on Twitter said, uh, ask if you would list several of the major hoped for outcomes if brain mapping proceeds quickly and successfully. I think certainly the, the, the uh, uh, variations on what's currently uh, progressing, uh, having to do with vision, hearing, uh, 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 Spinal cord injuries; uh, these are all uh, c could be improved by orders of magnitude. I think we could uh, get at uh, uh, things that affect activity over large uh, parts of the brain, uh, where the genetics is is uh, less clear. Environmental uh, components more important. Uh, possibly uh, such things as uh, uh, or uh, other neuropsychiatric d disorders. Uh, uh, bypassing parts of the brain as occur in uh, traumatic brain injury. There are a number of possibilities that, uh, that, that we, we will be uh, pursuing. Uh, final question, what was your reaction to the president even proposing this and their interest in this topic? I think the president was speaking in, in fairly broad strokes. Uh, it, it's, uh, I, I think, fairly evident to, to many people that, uh, that there's a lot of interesting research, uh, important uh, clinically for in neuroscience uh, broadly, and uh, we, we hope that this uh, gains momentum. It seems to be gaining momentum uh, both inside and outside of Washington. Our guest has been George Church. He's with Harvard Medical School, and he serves as their genetics professor, uh, hms.harvard.edu, also involved with uh, the Genome Project, and talking to us about brain mapping and uh, what might happen in the future. Uh, professor Church, thanks for your time this morning. Thank you. Coming up on Washington Journal tomorrow, uh, we have a shortened program because of our coverage of the National Governors Association, uh, an hour till end at 930. Uh, we'll start, though, at 7, and at 745, a roundtable fe featuring Todd Zwillick of Public Radio International. He's uh, their Washington correspondent for The Takeaway. And Leslie Clark with McClatchy Newspapers serves as their White House correspondent. We're going to talk about the latest news on sequestration, the spending cuts that are scheduled to kick in next Friday. They will share the perspectives of the White House and Congress 
and talk about the chances of the deal to ward off the cuts. We'll have that discussion at 745. And then at 845, a chance for you to learn about uh, the roles and responsibilities of the top leadership positions in both chambers of Congress. Joining us, John Haskell of Georgetown University. He's their Government Affairs Institute Senior Fellow. And he'll talk about what it's like to be a leadership and a person, how those positions came to be, what their responsibilities are. And you'll get to learn more about that. That discussion will be starting at 845. Don't forget, our Newsmakers program kicks off uh, on our program. To, uh, that's Sunday at 11 o'clock. And Bob Goodlatte. Uh, the Republican from Virginia will join us. As you may know, if you follow issues of Congress, he is the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, talked about a lot of topics uh, during that program. It's part of our weekly Newsmakers uh, series. That kicks off at 11 o'clock tomorrow on Sunday. You can catch it again at 6 o'clock. You probably may have seen our previous interview earlier this morning with our guest, Governor uh, Markell of Delaware. Uh, National Governors Association is in town this weekend, part of their winter meeting. Our coverage starts in just a few moments, uh, 10 o'clock. You'll get to see part of their session today. Uh, Governor Markell is the co-chair, along with Governor Fallon of uh, the Republican from Oklahoma, talking about a variety of things. Again, that's part of our National Governors Association coverage. That starts at 10. You can also listen to it on uh, C-SPAN radio. Uh, that's it for our Washington Journal program today. Again, another program comes to you tomorrow at 7 o'clock.